uh, Don Quixote where, you know, that's not, you're missing the point. Like the point is to still try because once you give up hope and once you stop trying, then all hope is lost. And, you know, we might, we might as well just eat a, eat a gun. Uh, uh, I, I don't recommend that to anybody. Uh, oh, that was the other one I wanted to talk about. Let's see, we're 35 minutes in. We still got time. Uh, I can do like a real full, full podcast. Uh, let's see. Comedy scene. All right. So, uh, 2007 Christmas day, I had started on Risperidone and I had a very vivid dream that I could play replay. It was what's called lucid dreaming. Um, and that's what gave me my idea for my first screenplay, which is called uh, Jewish Christmas, um, uh, JC, New Jersey. Um, I, I, I don't want to get into the plot or anything like that, but, uh, the results from that was I ended up creating another property, uh, idea for a movie to explain that and to pitch that. Uh, and that's where, uh, I was listening to NPR and heard, uh, Dangle and, uh, Junior's pitch about their book, uh, how to write screenplays for fun and for profit. And I read that book and, or I just listened to it on the tape. I kind of cheated. Um, no, no, no. I think I read it, but it was online. So I didn't really actually buy the book. Uh, but, uh, and that book is very informative and got me rolling. And one of the things that, um, I know, I'm sorry for, for getting your name, but junior, uh, junior, uh, the guy that plays junior on Reno 911, I should, uh, I should explain the guy that plays junior on Reno 911. Um, he started out doing stand up to get noticed as a screenwriter. And one of the first gigs that he got was being the Taco Bell dog. And he talks about stand up on that. You can look it up. And, um, but, uh, so I realized that I, I do need to work on my public speaking. I, you know, I had terrible stage fright and in 2014, that's what I did. I, I did my first, um, stand up at, uh, what's called new faces, which is like, it's called, it's a, basically a bringer show where you have it at the, at the Tempe improv you know, like where David Spade did his special and a bunch of other, you know, that's where professional comedians tour, things like that. So it's kind of like an honor to go there and do that. And I did okay. Like I, I, I removed the post from YouTube because I was just like, it was, it was a little gross and a little just inappropriate. And I was like, okay, I'd, maybe later at another time or something like that, I'll re-release it. But I just, eh, I just decided to pull it, but I did okay. And, uh, I realized that I need to work on this and I need to, to, to practice. And so at the time I had talked to my counselor who said that he had heard, um, that Jimmy Kimmel's sister ran an open mic, uh, in Tempe, which is like the next town over. <clears throat> and, uh, but she was using her at the time husband's last name and she went by Jill Bryan. And so sure enough, right there, the Dos Gringos on Priest and South of Elliot, uh, the Dos Gringos there uh, every Tuesday night at, I think it's 7 or 7.30. Um, that's where Jill Bryan or, you know, Jill Kimmel or whatever she goes by. I think she goes by Jill Kimmel now. But uh, had their open mic and I consistently went and I learned and there was great people like Kevin Gassman. I'll put a link in the description to Kevin Gassman. Um, uh, the, the gas man was worked as a DJ on local radio. Mostly he specializes in UFO, uh, talk, talk radio, I should say. But, uh, Kevin was really instrumental in that. And, uh, he had, he's, he, one of the things that he did when he was uh, guest hosting was he talked about, cause you know, the people that go to open mics are basically just all comics or people that want to be comics or want, you know, really, I guess, just to laugh at people trying hard. Um, and, uh, Kevin told us to, to, he's like, first of all, you guys are all sitting in the back, like you're the fucking cool kids. And that was the case. And th there was definitely a uh, clickish behavior. Um, and there, there always is, and always will be. And that's just the way it is. But he's like, sit up front and pay attention and let, and respond to the artist, whoever's performing that, you know, you, that you are listening instead of having another conversation or, you know, ordering food or whatever it is like show some respect. And that was one of the really great things that I liked. And so I practiced that and I sat up front and I was, you know, even if I didn't like the comedian, like I would pay attention to them and give them my attention because I wanted them to succeed. I wanted them to have the best experience they could. What's funny though, is that sort of enthusiasm 
turned on me and um, in, in many, many cases because I didn't realize uh, or I didn't uh, um, calculate that a lot of these comedians are very self-sabotaging, um, very self-destructive and are, are don't trust people. They have trust issues. And so, of course, uh, be, again, being in recovery, uh, you take people at face value. You don't want to read into uh, what they say because you really don't know what they're saying if you if you start interpreting it. So, but uh, one of my first interactions was uh, uh, with a guy named Bear Torres. So Bear, um, very talented, looked like he had uh, a, a lot of great, um, a great future. Uh, pretty good guitarist, very funny. Uh, would talk about how his he the counselor that he had ended up uh, luring him into some sort of uh, romantic affair and then fleecing him for uh, all of his money and then leaving town <laughs> like it was it was hilarious, but it was you know it was all based on true stories and uh, I remember one time I was hanging out with him afterwards and and we were just like horse playing and I ended up grabbing his boob and I was like geez that's a lot of titty there well come to find out bear used to be a girl. And I had no idea. And, and we had actually invited him back to our house when he told me. And I was kind of like freaking out. And he, the, you got to understand, though, like when I got into comedy, the only experience that I had had was watching Comedy Central and watching all these professionals, Jim Gaffigan and Chris Rock and, you know, Dave Chappelle and all these guys, Sarah Silverman, uh, Bill Burr. They all talk about the camaraderie that they have at these certain clubs where they kind of rip on each other. And, and it's in a very playful, friendly uh, good mannered way. Like it's, it's like, finally I can be myself around other comedians because these are people that find stuff funny. I was wrong. So, and George Lopez talks about this. He talked about this last time. I think he was on Stern about how in real life, most comedians are some of the most self-serving selfish pieces of garbage that will backstab you for, uh, applause. Um, and that I didn't know that. And so I, I, you know, I was fully committed. I went really, you know, balls deep in that AIDS butthole to to try to be a better person and a and a better comedian and a better writer. And so I would do stand up every week. I would actually uh, I'll get into that here in a second. But back to Bear. So Bear tells me that he used to be a girl, and I was like, "You're fucking lying." I goes, "Let me see, let me see your whatever your vagina. Like, what the fuck?" And I thought that would make a good story. Again, I was at the time. I think I was watching uh, Bobby Lee on uh joe rogan so i that that was my homework for stand-up you know and so i th that makes good stories but bear was not into it bear got really freaked out and was like what the fuck and at the time bear was working i think he was living with his auntie uh and uh was just you know broke and all this other stuff and just not not having a, a very good time and that's the other thing is too is a lot of these comedians are like 20 minutes from being homeless uh, they just, they live terrible lives and, and for the most part, they're terrible people. And that's why, and they, the, 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 com the comedy is their therapy, uh, is what I realized. And which is got good. You know, Jim Carrey talked about that g going up there and performing every night like that was, was definitely therapy for him. So, but, uh, back to, back to Bear, to Bear Torres, Bear had been doing, uh, or at least saying that he was doing, uh, uh, internet work. And could help me with my website, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds great. We can help each other. This is, you know, this is, this is great." Well, turns out Bear wasn't really good at that either. So, uh, <laughs> very good on stage, great, great, uh, you know, stage presence, but not a very good internet person. And I thought, you know what, this motherfucker is a bit of a fraud. Like, I need to call this motherfucker out. And so, uh, I went on to GoDaddy, and guess what was available? BearTorres.com, and I got the Bear Torres, even the misspelling. I got the BearTorres.org. Uh, I got it with a hyphen. I reserved like probably seven or eight uh, dot coms or URLs, I should say. And uh, then I went on stage the next week and I, I basically outed him. Not about it was not about being a, a trans. That was because that's the, the least about it. It was about being just a fake, you know, talk a lot, but no, you know, show kind of person. And then turning the whole thing about when I said, let me, you know, let me see your vagina sort of thing. Cause it's like, well, you're a dude now. Like th this is what dudes do. They show each other their dicks. Um, <laughs> and if you've never been to junior high and haven't seen anybody else's dick, you're kind of a weirdo. So but anyways, I, again, I thought it was a, a good joke. It would be a good story or something like that. But uh, bear turned it on me as if I'm the weirdo and I was the, you know, creeper. And I was like, what the fuck? I think mostly it had to do with 
that I actually owned a home and, you know, had like a real job or at least a real career and things like that. And a lot of these comedians are very sensitive to that sort of thing. They don't want to be poor, but they put all their eggs in their one basket about being a comedian. Like somehow being a comedian is going to save them. And it's like, no, common sense will save you. Uh, being reasonable will save you. Uh, actually paying attention uh, will save you. So, but, um, so that I, I had reserved all these dot coms and I even pointed them to me and I said, if you go to BearTorres.com right now, you'll actually go to my website. Like that's how good, you know, and I was basically calling them out. I also thought it'd be a funny joke. And then uh, the punchline at the end was the, to then give the dot com to Bear for, you know, the next five years, which is the limit that you can purchase them, which, you know, at the time was like 40 bucks. Like I didn't give a shit about 40 bucks. And uh, but guess what? It backfired. Everybody had sympathy for Bear because Bear was trans. Uh, and that's what I found out, you know, not until later that that's what all these people are attracted to is pity. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to call it sympathy, but it, that's what it is, is basically they want sympathy for uh, being brave about doing stand-up. It doesn't matter whether the, the stand-up is quality or not, or, or if the content that they talked about was quality. Uh, but it was, it, was a, it was about sympathy. And uh, I just thought that was kind of gross and inappropriate because it's like, how are you ever going to be a professional comedian like you talk about if number one, you can't handle money. Number two, you can't handle any sort of success or praise uh, that you always think that uh, people are, uh, you know, backstabbing you and, and that sort of thing. And but what's funny is they the, the really the community revolves around the gatekeepers. Uh, and Mike Brabiglia talks about this a little bit. I, this was a couple of years ago. I think it was um, two specials ago. Uh, and Mike does some really good work, by the way. He's not he's certainly not the flashiest or like laugh out loud comedian but he's very subtle and he's very accurate and uh, I, I highly recommend him but um, um, Mike had talked about this um, oh lost my train of thought there uh, basically oh gosh this is terrible well I'm all over the place now oh you'll have to forgive me uh, people though uh, really just depend on the sympathy part. And uh, if you don't give that sympathy uh, and, and, and that, and sometimes that shows up in like the alcoholism, like you won't have a drink with somebody, you know, then they say, Oh, you, you're better than me or you're better. You think you're better than us and things like that. And it did not help that I was actually pretty good at stand up. And um, so, but anyways, uh, back to me, right. That's what comedians always talk about. Me, me, me. Um, so I was consistent at going to the Tuesday night open mic. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot of open mics. There was probably maybe six, uh, which for a, a, a market, the size of Phoenix is not a lot. And, uh, what was great was, uh, I was learning from people. I was learning from people that would, uh, that Jill would ask to guest host. Um, and you know, most of the time these people sort of poo pooed the idea of hosting, like they acted like they were too cool for it. And me, I was like super enthusiastic about it, super excited. Um, I thought that was the greatest thing. You know, of course, all these kids are trying to be cool. They're in their 20s. I'm in, already in my 40s. Like I already look weird uh, going out to an open mic anyway. Like why the fuck do I want to be a comedian at 40? But I was like, Louis C.K. is a chubby, bald comedian at 40. And they're like, well, but he's been doing it for 10 years. Like, Oh, so if I, I started doing this 10 years prior, then it's okay. Like, what the fuck? Like, there's so much hypocrisy. But um, uh, it came down to being consistent and uh, uh, consistently good enough on the mic. And uh, Jill uh, Kimmel started asking me to host. And then it became sort of a regular thing, and which was great for Jill because Jill was still getting paid. Um, the gigs don't pay very much, by the way, just to kind of reveal the hand. Uh, Jill was getting like $100 a week uh, for hosting the open mic. And the idea, of course, is to get people into the restaurant who buy food and drinks. And it sort of covers that. The other thing that she would get was a $25 meal comp, uh, which is common practice. There's another guy, Charles Engel, that was getting $200 a week from the chop and walk. But of course, the chop and walk went out of business or whatever, got bought up. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't call these deals lucrative, but it's definitely a great gig for a side gig, something that you're doing after work, outside of work. Uh, and it's, you know, 
you get to sort of be part of the community and you get to bond with people. Um, it's better than taking some sort of weird art class. So, which we found out happens on other nights at the Dos Gringos. <laughs> when you show up there like on a Wednesday, you're like, oh, am I here the wrong night? Like, why are all these ladies painting weird shit? So, but, uh, you know, and Dos Gringos was doing that every night to try to get people into their fucking bar and buy their overpriced weird margaritas that came out of a machine. So, but anyways, uh, so Jill started leaning on me to be the host and I started pushing people away, not on purpose, but just because, uh, I would, I was trying to be a funny host that was like, had integrity and like, um, uh, trying to be honest, trying to grow as a person. And then the, the other thing that uh, I discovered in the comedy when I started going was that comedians would, would do the same jokes every week. And this would go on for like a month uh, or two months. And for some comedians, uh, they would, they, they keep the same jokes for years. And uh, I, I don't understand that. Uh, you know, when I listened to what uh, Louis CK was talking about was that, you know, what he would do is he would uh, he would take his closing uh, joke, which is typically the best one, and then he would open with that the next whatever night or session or whatever it was like whatever month, and that's that's how you basically make Damascus steel is you pound the shit out of it and then you fold it over and you pound the shit out of it again, and that's how you become better and stronger and things like that. And so that was one of the first things that I I stepped in and and started encouraging other comedians to do was like. And then also because of listen to Stern, you know, Howard Stern talks about his staff being all writers. Like everybody is a writer. Everybody wants, everybody needs to contribute. And uh, so we're all writers. And then, you know, when you get credit on the show, you're credited as a writer because that's what it takes to be a writer is just, you want to contribute and be part of the, you know, the, the team. And so I encouraged as a host, I encouraged people to come up and experiment. Like this is the time to experiment. This is the time to try new stuff out. And, and, um, uh, uh, just get better at be, at doing stand up rather than you know relying on old jokes. Uh, but um, and that's where I sort of found a divide in people. Like people either really liked me or really hated me. And uh, there are some people that really just were clicky. Um, and you can check them out. I I I support their careers. I think they're garbage. But you can support their careers. I don't want to badmouth them in a backstabbing way, the way they do me. Um, there was a point where I was on the Arizona comedians Facebook page and it got so bad that people were telling me to commit suicide and all this other stuff. And I was like, what the fuck that was, by the way, I forget his name is something McGee, but the guy wears a, a Lucha Libre mask as, as his skit or whatever as his gimmick. <laughs> He's, you know, again, uh, one of the feedback things that I got from people in the community when I said, you know, why do not, pe why do people not like me? And they're like, one of the things that they talked about was they said, you don't need this, Patrick. You come up here like it's fun. And I go, it is fun. It's supposed to be fun. And they go, no, 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 no. People need this. Like, this is the only thing in their lives. I go, well, that's a sad fucking life if, if that's the only thing you need in your life. But again, most of these people, like I said, are about 20 minutes from being homeless or they are homeless. Uh, they have dependency issues. Um, uh, typically they go and do comedy so that they can drink with other people and be socially accepted uh, because typically they're, they're uh, an angry alcoholic within their family or their families are fucked up and they're the nice one. It's like, it's a whole dysfunctional fucked up mess. So, but one of them is uh, Michael Longfellow who I recently saw a bit on. He, he's become a much better performer uh, and his style is very great. I think he'd be great in a sitcom. Uh, but as a, as a person, no, he's a piece of garbage. Um, and he also did a, a, a spot on the Conan show, which I was like, way to go, dude. But, uh, you can, you guys, if you guys want to creep around on the, uh, Arizona comedians, Facebook page, you can see all kinds of just dysfunctional behavior. One of the other car wrecks would be, um, oh, what's his name? Howard Hughes. The guy's name is actually Howard Hughes, and he's probably most famous for being a complete fuck up on Bar Rescue twice. And he used to run a place called uh, Scottsdale Stand Up. And that was a weird experience because I had actually got, you know, into stand up. And I think Jill had let me host one night for the first time, and I was like ecstatic. And Jill was sort of entertained by this. And so I decided to go and try my luck at uh, Stand Up Scottsdale, which had like a 30-person deep list for their 
open mic. And then what they would do is they would then bring in uh, a quote unquote professional comedian, an established comedian, I should say, that would then perform for 20 minutes. And the whole idea is to keep you there as long as possible. It was like a very huge manipulation. So, but Howard Hughes would actually, he, he was very instrumental in creating a culture that was like, you know, dog eat dog. Like, you know, the way that you can be the best is if you destroy other comedians. And I was like shocked at this. Like he, there was the, the night that I went, like he encouraged two guys to like fight, like two comedians who were just, they were giving jabs to each other on stage. And it seemed, you know, like well within reason of what a comedian can bear, but I apparently not. And so I had no idea who these guys were and they, and they were ready to fight. And he was like, all right. and then he, like, he shows up, you know, as the hero and goes, all right, all right, take this outside. You know, like, let's go outside and film this. Like the guy is a complete monster. Uh, Howard Hughes is. And uh, it, it took probably a year before uh, I, I encouraged Jill to unfriend him from Facebook. I was like, why the fuck are you still following this guy? Like, you must have like really bad self-esteem. Like, this guy is not important. Is he the gatekeeper at a, a, a club? Yeah. But he ran that thing into the fucking ground. It was like one of the grossest places that I've ever been to. One of the grossest places I ever peed in. And I've peed in some pretty gross places. So, and that was stand-up Scottsdale. And then he went over and uh, basically took over a place that was called the Speakeasy. It was a nicer place. They, he tricked, I don't want to say tricked, he talked investors into turning it into a much bigger club and then ran that into the ground as well. So, but that's the guy that, that would basically created a culture of comedians destroying other comedians so that you would be the only comedian left. And, it, and it's still... It's it's the easiest thing to feed into is that you know putting blood you know basically chum the waters uh, for desperate comedians to then attack one another. Which one of the reasons why I was attracted to Jill Kimmel's open mic was because she didn't do that. She like was very encouraging, like you know very motherly. In fact, in the in the community, she was very motherly, trying to you know especially to the trans community, uh, people that would come out even just just telling an audience that they're trans, you know, was very intimidating and very liberating at the same time. And so uh, I was all down for that. And that was one of, the, one of the other reasons why that was one of the only open mics that I consistently went to. And uh, so, and of course, uh, Jill found me to be an adult. I was over 40 and consistent and trustworthy. And so she entrusted uh, the open mic to me for uh, almost two years. And, um, I found out later, one of the things when I asked, uh, you know, some other comedians, I said, what, what are some of the things that you don't like about me? And one, one comedian said that uh, the fact that Jill Kimmel even knows my name is like disgusting. And I was like, wow, what the fuck? Like, this is completely off base. And uh, shout out to Jill, by the way, for, for, for entrusting me and, and definitely giving me the exposure that uh, I wanted and the experience that I wanted. Um, uh, as far as um, people goes and as far as in the open mic community, she's great. As far as being in the new, uh, was it Real Housewives of Gilbert? You know, you can see her com comedy. It's not for everybody. It's definitely not for me. She invited me out one night. Um, uh, she was opening for David Allen Greer and uh, she, you know, did her routine. And it, it's, is it entertaining? Yes. For like maybe a party or a bar mitzvah or whatever. And, uh, it, it, you know, I, I saw her finally do some, you know, blue comedy, some dirty comedy that was actually really killer. I think she, she told me she did it at a, like a distillery. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the wild turkey distillery, but some, some sort of distillery and she did very well with it. And I was like, you know, really proud of her and trying to help her, you know, write new jokes and be fresh and, and always consistently changing. But, um, um, so, uh, back to that story with Jill. Uh, so, she, you know, she, Jill invited me back to the green room, of course, to meet David Allen Greer, who's one of my, you know, childhood heroes. Um, and uh, <laughs> she asked me, she's like, well, what did you think of my show? And I was like, well, I wouldn't do those jokes, but I'm, you know, I'm glad you did and you did pretty well. Uh, and so it's, it's one of those things where, like, I, I ended up having a falling out with Jill and I'll explain that here uh, in a little bit. Oh, it's already an hour. So the, this thing is fucking running out of time. It's going to give me two videos, but. Uh, you know what? I'm going to stop there. I'm going to leave you wanting more, right? That's what they'd say. I always leave people wanting more, but, uh, I'll tell you about my celebrity experiences and also, 
uh, experiences with Joe Kimmel. So I love you guys. Part two here in a little bit.